destruction from Hurricane Milton is having a big impact on the sports world. Plus, college football is having one of its biggest regular season days in a long time, and we're checking in on the MLB playoffs and controversy around Kendrick Perkins' NIL company. It's Friday, October 11th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're examining what we know about the damage to the Tampa Bay Rays Stadium from Hurricane Milton and what that means for the team's future with our editor, Dennis Young. FOS writer David Rumsey joins to break down college football's huge weekend and to discuss the proposed super conference idea. And we're chatting with my colleague Daryl Barnes about what's stirring up sports social media. Plus, Bob Costas is getting some rough reviews for his broadcasting, and Mets owner Steve Cohen is very happy with his huge investment. First, let's hit some headlines. One of the biggest stars of his generation is retiring. Rafael Nadal announced he'd officially be stepping away from tennis following the end of the 2024 season. Rafa released a video announcement noting that, quote, the reality is that it has been some difficult years, these two especially. I don't think I've been able to play without limitations. Although he hasn't been in his normal superstar form, the 22-time Grand Slam winner walks away with $560 million in career earnings, according to Sportico, including $135 million in tournament winnings. With 23-year-old Yannick Sinner officially claiming the year-end number one spot in the world rankings, it's safe to say the new era of tennis has officially begun. Meanwhile, a former NFL star makes his way to ESPN. Cam Newton is joining the weekly rotation on First Take, debuting this morning, just one day after the announcement was made. Lately, ESPN has been investing more in his big names, Stephen A. Smith, Pat McAfee, Shams Tarania, etc., while cutting the mid-level talent like RG3, Samantha Ponder, and Zach Lowe. Newton brings a similar level of notoriety, but possibly at a lower price point. The former NFL MVP said that fans can expect the same intensity I brought to the field along with real talk, bold takes, and good fun. And you won't have to wait long to see him. According to a tweet from Connor J. Hughes on Tuesday morning, Robert Sala, in his final act as Jets head coach, demoted Nathaniel Hackett from play calling duties and handed the responsibility over to Todd Downing due to the Jets' poor offensive performance. Five minutes later, Sala got a call from Woody Johnson informing him that he was relieved of his duties as head coach. Despite Salah's firing, it seems that Hackett's demotion still stands. In his first press conference as the interim head coach, Jeff Ulbricht said that Downing will continue to be the play caller going forward, saying, This is more a byproduct of seeking a different take on things. I'm not saying it's a better or worse take on things by any means, but just a different take on things, a fresh approach. On to MLB. The Minnesota Twins are for sale. This makes them the second team in Minnesota on the market, as the Timberwolves are still in the process of being sold, or not, depending on how the arbitration goes. The Polad family, who've owned the Twins since 1984, announced the sale in a post on social media yesterday. And apparently, this isn't the first time the Polads have tried to sell the team. In 1997, Carl Polad attempted to sell the team and have it relocated to North Carolina. In 2001, he offered to sell the Twins back to MLB for $150 million. He's likely happy those attempts fell through. Forbes has them valued at $1.46 billion. Hurricane Milton is continuing to wreak havoc in the southeast, specifically in Florida, where multiple sports teams have been substantially impacted. The Buccaneers had to leave town early, the Jaguars had their flight to London delayed, but the biggest development was the massive damage to Tropicana Field, the home of the Rays. Wednesday night, photos and videos emerged that showed much of the domed roof ripped apart and the field exposed. Naturally, this has led to questions about when the stadium could be ready to host baseball again, and if it makes sense for the Rays to build a new ballpark in the same area of St. Petersburg. FOS News editor Dennis Young has the latest, and he joins us next. Joined now by Front Office Sports News editor Dennis Young, making his podcast debut. Welcome, Dennis. Hi, Owen. How you doing? Great. Great to have you on. Um, so Hurricane Milton is, is doing, obviously, all kinds of damage to the southeast. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a very difficult situation for, for millions of people there. Uh, one of the problems is that Tropicana Field, home of the Tampa Bay Rays, had its roof torn off or partly, you know, partly torn off. What do we know about the damage to the field right now? Yeah, uh, overnight last night, uh, Wednesday night, uh, for whenever this comes out, uh, you, there's these overhead videos where you saw uh, the fiberglass panels, which, uh, you know, if you didn't know, the Rays have the only dome stadium in baseball, the only permanently dome stadium in baseball. There's another handful of, of retractable domes, and the roof there in St. Pete is made out of these, like, fiberglass panels that are covered in Teflon, uh, graded to 110, 115 mile an hour wind gusts. And clearly the uh, wind from Milton was, was stronger than that. And so these unbelievable images coming out of St. Petersburg last night where the panels are, are ripped off. You know, there's just these little ribbons flapping around these 
uh, 180 miles of, of cables, of, of steel cables that make up the rest of the roof. And now today, you know, after the storm has passed, you can see these, all these overhead videos where the field is completely exposed. Uh, you know, the, there's, there's nothing there. There's, there's some ribbons like swinging off uh, in the wind <laughs> off these cables. And, and that's basically it. It looks like a stadium that's in, in the middle of being demolished. Yeah. And it may be too early to, to really know what this means for them, but they have a, a baseball season to play in, yeah. you know, five and a half months. That's not a ton of time when it comes to major construction like this, major repairs. Do we know anything about the viability of the stadium for next season? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I'm not a structural engineer and, and, and in some ways, you know, the St. Pete and, and Tampa area was, was lucky in that this is maybe like the most uh, enduring image other than uh, in, in downtown Tampa, a, a crane crashed into an office building. But, you know, a lot of the, the damage from the, the storm appears to have been in these smaller, less populated towns uh, south of St. Pete and, and Tampa. But, uh, you know, no, the, the Rays just were, were recording this at, at three o'clock on Thursday afternoon, about half an hour ago, the Rays put out a statement that, they expect to be able to assess the damage in the coming days and months. You know, my, my colleague, Eric Fisher, who has reported a lot about the uh, construction of the stadium, is, points out that n nothing in the stadium is, is built for uh, being outside in the sun, being outside in the rain. You know, these, these South Florida stadiums have built roofs and domes because it rains a lot in the afternoon and, and the early evening in Florida in the summer. And, you know, that's why the Rays have a, a permanent roof. Uh, again, the only team in baseball with, with a permanent roof. Uh, like you said, they ha it's October and they have until March to kind of uh, figure something out. The Rays have talked about relocating before. Uh, you know, they're not. I, I have not heard anything of them talking about that now, but they've talked about doing a part season plan where they're in Tampa, you know, in the Tampa area in the fall and Montreal in the summer. Uh, you know, that that's pure speculation. But uh, they could also, you know, play with with no roof again, like like Eric Fisher points out. There's there's no drainage. There's it, it is not. It's not set. Up, it's not set up to be a convertible uh, outdoor stadium. But that, that's the very limited what we know right now. You know, I think the, the state and local response was is more focused elsewhere right now. I mean, this is just property damage. You know, the Rays came out and said this morning that there's no no people were in there when it happened, but no one was injured. Everyone was safe. Uh, but I think yeah, we'll come to see that more uh, as the fall and winter play out here. Yeah, yeah, and of course this is obviously not the top priority with you know now the second hurricane passing through the area right yeah um the rays are you know they've secured financing for a new stadium in the same basic area uh the county gave them a little over 300 million dollars to do that still a couple of years before they would actually be playing there do you see this incident having any implications for that new stadium it's i mean it's it's the right question to be asking you know i mean I think the the amount of rainfall that hit St. Pete and Tampa was supposed to be, a, you know, not even a, a gener some type of, you know, every couple hundred years or, or a thousand year storm. But as, as climate change impacts, you know, the United States and the coastal areas and Florida more, you know, how, how frequently are these storms going to come into play? You know, can you build a roof that is graded for 140 or 160 mile an hour winds? If, if that's like the new normal of a hurricane, I, I don't know. Again, I'm not a, a structural engineer, but I think that these are obviously the types of questions that stadiums and, and sports all over are going to have to answer as, you know, if they're looking five or 10 or 20 years down the road and, and catastrophic weather events become, you know, not uh, once a decade or once every three decades, but you know, way more frequent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, I, these stadiums are supposed to last maybe 30 years. Um, and I feel like we've had, I don't know how many like hundred thousand year weather events in the last decade or so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to be the new reality. And obviously Milton was, you know, a, a really serious storm. I mean, obviously in the, in the years that the Tropic Canada has existed, there have been big storms and none of them, you know, tore off the, the roof all in one fell swoop overnight. Dennis Young. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks on. ESPN is doing everything in their power to let the world know that they hired Shams Tarania. Yesterday, the NBA insider appeared on SportsCenter, First Take, The Pat McAfee Show, and Get Up. As for what he was there to talk about, Shams reported that LeBron James and Bronny James could appear on the court in the Lakers' first game of the season. Normally, it would be strange for a team to plan to play their biggest star with the last guy on the bench long before the game has even happened, but in this case, it's probably a good idea. 
get the big moment out of the way because you're going to have to answer questions about it until it happens. Once in a while, it's fine for the off-court stuff to impact the actual games, and this is one of those moments. Over to someone who has been on TV for as long as Bronny or Shams has been alive, Bob Costas is a legendary broadcaster, but the reviews have not been kind on his play-by-play -play calling on the Yankees-Royals division series. He had at least one outright blunder when he lost sight of a ball that he called a hit into the outfield that was actually caught by the second baseman. On another instance, he seemed more interested in harping on the Yankees' base running than acknowledging an incredible defensive play by Royals shortstop Bobby Witt Jr. And at one point, he didn't realize his mic was on while he was muttering about not being pleased at, about doing a CNN promo. Costas is a giant of the field. I don't want to take anything away from his career. And his name alone still carries some weight. But there are a lot of very good broadcasters out there who are calling games throughout the regular season. TBS's contract with MLB runs for four more years after this one, and they ought to find a play-by-play -play person who makes fewer headlines than what's happening on the field. To the other New York team, the Mets went into the season with very few expectations, and now as the first team into the league championship series, they are playing with house money. Well, they're playing with Steve Cohen's money, but he doesn't seem to mind. After the Mets beat the Phillies to advance on Wednesday, he told the New York Post, quote, that 341 is looking pretty freaking good right now, referring to Francisco Lindor's 10-year $341 million contract that began in 2022. The Mets had the highest payroll in baseball this year and last, though that counts the $56 million they paid this season to Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer to play for other teams. The Yankees are still the Yankees. They have a history unmatched by any other American sports franchise, but their second best player, Juan Soto, is about to be a free agent, and Cohen is sure to give them a massive bidding war. The battle for the heart of New York baseball is suddenly alive and well. Heading over to college sports, Kendrick Perkins' NIL company, Nilly, is coming under scrutiny as details of the deals they are offering come to light. We don't know everything about Nilly's offers, but ESPN reporting on one of its own big screen contributors obtained one deal in which the athlete was given $50,000 up front in exchange for 25% of their NIL earnings for the length of the deal up to $125,000. The numbers here can vary, and Nilly reportedly offers some athletes upfront payments in the six figures. The real question here is if Nilly is offering services that allow the athlete to earn more than they would otherwise, or is this little more than an upfront payment with major interest on the other side? It's hard to tell because this space lacks transparency and regulation. If athletes had a more open marketplace of similar offers, we might have a better understanding of what's fair here. And if Nilly had more of a track record, we could better evaluate what they're offering. The basic framework here can make sense for some number of college athletes, but are the actual deals good ones? That's much harder to tell. College football is having a huge weekend of big matchups made possible by conference realignment. Meanwhile, there is talk of redoing the entire system with super conferences taking the place of the collage we have now. My colleague David Rumsey has looked into all of this, and he joins us next. Joined now by Front Office Sports newsletter writer David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. So let's start with this weekend. Saturday has a crazy slate of college football games, uh, including Texas versus Oklahoma, Ohio State, Oregon, Ole Miss against LSU. Um, what, what do you when you kind of look at this this landscape and all these these big powerhouse schools matching up against each other? Where does your mind go in terms of how this all came together? Yeah, this weekend has kind of encircled on college football fans' calendars, even since before the season. There was people on social media saying, make sure you don't have a wedding to go to on October 12th because of the games you mentioned. Uh, there's also Florida, Tennessee, with Tennessee still ranked. Um, so but big, big weekend in college football, and a lot of it is made possible because of conference realignment. I mean, you have Ohio State, Oregon. It's a Big Ten matchup. You have Texas and Oklahoma, longtime Red River rivalry, right? But this is the first time it's part of the SEC and it's on ABC. It's going to be a, a huge uh, game for them Saturday afternoon. Then Saturday night, what do you have? Uh, Saturday afternoon, you have Penn State USC as well. Another Big Ten matchup that we didn't even get into. Ole Miss LSU, that's, that's an SEC matchup, right? But, you know, ESPN Disney has all the SEC matchups now. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens in prime time when it's Ole Miss and LSU against Ohio State and Oregon on NBC, who com comes out on top? Are people going to be split between uh, wh which game to watch? So I'll be interested to see those numbers next week. It's sort of like we're having all these like all-star games mm -hmm. or like playoff games um, that you would normally have to wait till the playoff or just wouldn't happen at all, of course, uh, because of conference realignment. 
And, you know, obviously realignment is still, it's a big upheaval. There are real problems with it. It's destroyed regionalism. At the same time, you get these matchups that are pretty exciting that you just wouldn't be on the calendar otherwise. And the networks are benefiting. The ticket prices are, are going up too. Yeah, exactly. And it's just kind of like you were saying, I mean, these these crazy matchups that you just de- never got before because the Big Ten has 18 teams now and the SEC has 16 teams. So does the Big 12. So it's it's weird for sure. You know, USC being a member of the Big Ten, that's a little weird, just like Oregon as well. But uh, I think overall, I, people are starting to see, hey, this is kind of cool, at least once the games are happening on Saturdays and you're not thinking about the air miles and what the student athletes might have to go through to get there. Just when the games are happening, it's, it's a lot of fun. So there's this been this proposal came out uh, or, you know, revealed recently uh, proposing, you know, instead of having these conferences that are all just kind of like it's musical chairs all the time now, why not just have super conferences, mm-hmm. one big one that's like the all the division one schools or, you know, all the the top schools below that you'd have a subset of FBS schools and we do promotion and relegation makes a lot of sense on paper in, until maybe you kind of get into the reality of what that would take. Yeah, exactly. There's actually multiple proposals floating around and maybe even more that haven't even been unearthed yet. But a lot of powerful people um, inside college football and outside of college football kind of wanting to cash in on this changing dynamic, the shifting, evolving landscape of college football. We kind of covered it this week in the front office sports newsletter, and we just kind of looked at what has been proposed and is it really feasible? So last week, this group called College Sports Tomorrow officially unveiled their proposal for a super league that would put all the FBS schools together. There'd be a top division, a lower division. There'd be promotion and relegation like you have in European soccer or in everywhere else in the world except the United States. And then their separate proposal came out or was reported by Yahoo Sports this week called Project Broody, which was not quite the same with promotion and relegation, but still wanted to pull pool everybody's media rights together and you know only schedule games against Power Four conferences. And like you said, Owen, it's theoretically it all sounds great, whether it's a super league with promotion and relegation or if it's selling all your media rights together. But the reality is, as if you look at the TV contracts, all the Power Four conferences have huge billion dollar deals with Fox, CBS, ABC, ESPN uh, through the rest of this decade. So if anything is going to happen, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Not to mention Notre Dame, not to mention the college football playoff. There's so much money tied up that could it happen? Sure. Well, is it going to be 2040 before something like that happened? I think that's probably more likely than on the sooner end. On, on one hand, I, I find these proposals very appealing because like just to take one example, like why is USC in the Big Ten? Mm-hmm. It's not like a bunch of people got together and said, you know what, we should actually rearrange things like these matchups make more sense. And I mean, to, obviously, to some degree, there was that, but it was the media deal. They they didn't like the Pac-12 media deal. They liked the Big Ten media deal better. The Big Ten, you know, liked the name, whatever. It's it, it all worked out, but it's all very circumstantial all based on like what was available at the time. And that's kind of the basic story of all this upheaval. And so a top-down system that is based in logic and like brings back some amount of regionalism, um, I think makes a lot of sense at the same time. Yeah. Like when's it going to happen? And also if it's good for like, you know, some number of schools and conferences is probably if in the sort of the zero sum game sense of this, not good for for a lot of like the SEC and Big Ten right now have like these huge media deals. Um, they can probably get another even bigger media deal when their contract is running up instead of saying, you know what, let's let's just like kind of be subsumed by this new organization that we're not in control of. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen until like this whole thing deteriorates further. Um, at the same time, I find the concept appealing, but yeah, the reality is probably not going to happen. Yeah, I would agree with you. Owen, and it's kind of like, this is almost like fan fiction coming to life a little bit because it's one thing to see something on a Reddit board or a college football message board of just like, Hey, what if the conferences looked like this? What if there was a super league that looked like that? But to see people with real money and real influence and even some administrators, athletic directors, university presidents getting behind something or saying they would get behind something, 
that is a little bit of progress and maybe it has a little bit more life than some people would like to think. But because of what we've been talking about for the past few minutes, there's just so many challenges and so many parties involved in college football, in college sports, getting everybody on the same page as we've seen, whether it's with NIL or uh, college football playoff expansion. It just takes so much time. So I guess the message is never say never, but don't expect anything anytime soon. Yeah, I, th I think that is the correct message. David Rumsey, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com fieldofgreens.com. Sports social media is abuzz with all sorts of stuff, including possibly the craziest looking basketball court you've ever seen. My colleague Daryl Barnes joins us next to discuss that and more. Joined now by front office sports multimedia reporter Daryl Barnes. Welcome, Daryl. Hey, Owen. How's it going? Going great. So you have your finger on the pulse of sports social media uh, first stories out of Kentucky. What, what's the news there? Yeah, so Kentucky basketball is making history. They are becoming the first college basketball program or college basketball event to play on an LED video floor. Um, so this is the same court um, made by a company called ASB Glass Floor that was used at N NBA All-Star Weekend last year that, during the three-point contest, the dunk contest. You're going to get some really cool social media clips out of this, I'm expecting, because it's basically a basketball court but it's a TV screen underneath your feet. <laughs> um, but so it's some of the animations are designed by this guy, Connor Henkel um, and his new like Coliseum company. He's basically the former motion graphics designer at Oregon and known in the industry for doing some of the top like in stadium graphics, like on the jumbotrons and all the ribbon boards like around the stadiums. He's done some of the coolest ones that I have seen in sports. We're talking the Washington Commanders, Vandy, LSU. Um, but Overall, just it's going to be cool to see this court in another mainstream event. I know it's just kind of Kentucky's kickoff event for their preseason. Um, you know, it's a team scrimmage, but it's for but it's just going to be cool to see, I think. Yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. It almost sounds like the Las Vegas sphere, but a basketball court. And and yeah, it makes sense that they're not doing it for a regular season game, at least not yet, because it's probably regulations around that and it would be really distracting if i don't know there's animations under your feet as you're running um but it sounds like a lot of fun and apparently these things are strong enough that you can you know jump on them and slam a basketball into them and that's gonna be fine yeah i mean probably yeah, again yeah it's probably too expensive and too gimmicky for like a regular season game but as you know part of a one-off event like gonna be something cool to see this next one is I mean, more than a, a sort of gimmicky thing, this goes into the world of, of sports media more generally. Uh, Shams Charania is, is an ESPN employee and they are letting you know any way they can. Yeah, it is official. On Thursday, he basically went through the full gauntlet of ESPN shows that he's going to be making his appearance on, a full car wash per se. Get up. First take, the McAfee show, Sports Center. I mean, Greeny called it though, and when he was introducing him, he called it the thing that most people thought would never happen. And welcomes, you know, Shams to the show. He dropped news like literally 10 seconds into his first take debut. Stephen A said, Hey, welcome Shams. And then he said, I got some news for you, um, announcing Danny Green's retirement. And then it honestly looks like he didn't even move from his seat. Um, 
to do the McAfee show. It almost looked like he was in the Seaport studio still against the window as he did his hit on the McAfee show. But I thought it was just a fun day and he looked like he belonged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. From what I can tell, he looked comfortable. And, you know, I mean, and this is this is the gig he signed up for. He's not just breaking new. I mean, obviously, he's got a lot of TV experience from his previous gigs, but this is a level up in terms of exposure. Yeah, it's a level up. You're going from, you know, stadium, the athletic to the worldwide leader in sports. And so it'll be really cool to see how his role progresses. And he kind of seems like someone who may be down to do more TV appearances than Woj, but that's just a hunch given that, you know, he's a younger, really good looking guy who's really active on social media, right? So. Yeah, less of just kind of like the traditional, like beating the pavement reporter, more just like on every possible channel or on every possible show on one channel in this case. Yeah. Um, let's hop, or, hop over to our last story. So we had a debut of an NHL team, uh, or I, technically it's the same franchise as the Coyotes, but no one's thinking of them as the, the Coyotes. Utah, hockey, hockey is in Utah now. Yeah, and Utah is buzzing in more ways than one. Yeah, they're talking about... You know, they're celebrating their first official win on Tuesday. and But fans are really enjoying what it seems like is the fan-friendly concession prices. That's things like the $3, not, $3 nachos, hot dogs, ice cream. But then also, even more so, they're enjoying the beer. Our friend AJ Perez wrote an article um, about $120,000 of beer sales during the Utah Hockey Club's home opener. One hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars. Yeah, keep in mind the you know the rest of the concession prices are very fan friendly, but beer still are fourteen to sixteen dollars, um, depending on the brand for a twenty four ounce can. But that is some serious change for beer sales in one game. Yeah, though honestly, like the three dollar nachos is the most exciting part of that for me. I don't think <laughs> I've gotten three dollar nachos like. In, in the last two decades so um or like maybe ever in my life so yeah, well, anyway really you know <laughs> good move on them to introduce themselves three dollars not even just a good price for a stadium that's like a good price for like some street nachos period uh, absolutely um all right we'll leave it on street nachos daryl barnes thanks so much for joining us <laughs> thank you owen always a pleasure Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. College football's biggest day of the year is tomorrow, and for the most marquee matchups, it's going to cost you a pretty penny to get in the door. Texas and Oklahoma meet for the 120th matchup in the Red River rivalry, and for the first time as SEC opponents after Oklahoma joined the conference this season. The hype is palpable, and the ticket cost reflects that. For Oklahoma fans who want to sit in that section, the lower end seats available on the secondary market begin around $400. The highest price ticket between SeatGeek, Ticketmaster, and StubHub is $9.56. For the lower bowl seats, the cheapest option is $4.25, but that can climb all the way up to $18.20 on SeatGeek. On the other side, Texas fans will be coughing up more to see their 5-0 Longhorns. Tickets in the upper bowl on the Texas side range from $5.35 on StubHub all the way up to $3,379, the price of some Super Bowl tickets. In the lower bowl, the highest priced available ticket in the secondary markets is just under 3 k but all tickets are at least $660. Well, it's an important day in the history of this rivalry, Texas still has a comfortable edge in the all-time matchup, leading 63 wins to 51 losses with five ties mixed in. Add all those numbers together and you still don't get anywhere close to what these tickets would cost you. That's it for today. Keep an eye out for our weekend interview series and make sure you're subscribed wherever you like to get your shows. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.